there are a thousand worlds within this one world of grass. Some men sensed that at once. Others never did. with enough geological age to have developed distinct watercourses and drainage systems. Waves of flowers advancing with each stage of a growing season in myriad patterns and textures of grasses that varied moment by moment with the sun and wind and the cloud shadows that drove across the land. Helianthus rigidus. Helianthus tuberosus. The prairie is distinctive because of its grass, but the prairie is not only grass, it is forest edges, it is valleys, it is vast savannas with clumps of bur oak trees, it is rocky outcrops, it is birds and animals, it is bright flowers and seed heads that rattle and blow in the wind. Yet the prairie is more, it is sun and wind and sky with horizons that never end. Liastris aspera, Liastris cylindracia, Liastris ligillostylis, Liastris pumpata. prairie in wind, Liastris pinkostachia, thick blue stem, Liastris squarosa, on the clean Ligodesmia junkia, prairie in summer spinulosa. is soft, undulating leaves frosted. Crimson paintbrush, Parthenium harbor of the Pamphylia nests in fresh prints. Pernanthes aspera, Pernanthes racemosa. Winter booms up in the prairie. Cold and harsh, chunks of ice moon swallow its warmth. Like prairie roses dying from summer to snow. Soul of prairie is blown, blown. And ever leaving.
I lie here just under the wind. The grass is harping and singing faintly. Their tones rising and falling. The prairie world washing over me. There is no point in moving. With a little time, the wind will bring the world to me in a steady and varied traffic. Watching under the brim of my hat, I see a dragon flying. Alias devils darning me, darting downward to the slough off below. Next comes a squadron of monarch butterflies on their way to some crimson patch of butterfly milkweed. A male bobolink arrives 20 feet above me, hanging on the wind and stating his territorial claims with a flow of bubbling song, and then slides off to the east. His departure reveals the red-tailed hawk that he had eclipsed. The hawk appears to be busily occupied, but he doesn't fool me. He's just another loafer, and it takes one to know one. To one unaccustomed to it, there is something inexpressibly lonely in the solitude of the prairie. The loneliness of a forest seems nothing to it. There, the view is shut in by trees, and the imagination is left free to picture some livelier scene beyond. But here, you have an immense extent of landscape without a sign of human existence. We have the consciousness of being far, far beyond the bounds of human habitation. We feel as if moving the midst of a desert world. Amorpha canescence. Amorpha nana. Zeroas, Astragalus, Normas, Agrestis. MT Prairie. We Astragalus, Canada. Astragalus, Below Canada. Astragalus, in a shadow. Astragalus, Crescent Harbor. And the great blue sky above. Astragalus, and birds flying in the promenade and singing with joy. Astragalus, from the sun is rising. And all the whole Normas Prairie. There was no sign Bapticia that any other human being had ever been there. Bapticia Lactia. Everything Hemicista about the summer sky Fisciculata. is spectacular, showy, theatrical. The stars in the evening, Dahlia, Pendida, the moons at midnight, Dahlia, the rays of the morning Dahlia, sun, they all Dahlia, shine with special Lepidina. brilliance. In summer, Dahlia, the waters of Lepidina. lakes and ponds mirror the clouds Dahlia, by day. Velosa. The moon by night. Desmanthus, the fireflies in the grass repeat the stars above. Desmodium, the drops of the dew catch and magnify the rays of the morning sun. All the prairie world is in summer but a screen to show off the glorious sky. Shot gold, blue, and violet. Dazzling silver, emerald, fawn. Fields whole amplitude and nature's multiform power consigned for once to colors. The light and the general air possessed by them, colors till now unknown. No limit can find, not the western sky alone, the high meridian, north, south, all. Pure luminous color, biting the silent shadows to the last. Soralidium batesii. There are certain prairie indicators that are quite accurate, for such plants do not occur in concert if the land has been intensely used. Well-drained uplands of original prairie will invariably be occupied by stands of little blue stem, prairie drop seed, side oats grama, and other native mid-grasses. Farther down from them, of course, there will be viviparous stands of the tall stem, big blue stem, Indian grass, slough grass, and other airy patches of tall panicum. Depending on the season, there will be such forbs as compass plant, rattlesnake master, blazing star, yellow star grass, blue-eyed grass, black samson, yellow coneflower, bottle gentian, wood betony, and semen, and many others. Wild legumes such as lead plant, purple prairie clover, and wild indigo are usually sure signs of genuine prairie for they are among the first to vanish from tamed land and are often the last to return. Conversely, a closed community of Old Stand Prairie isn't likely to include such invaders as purple vervain, Canada thistle, dandelion, ragweed, Kentucky bluegrass, red clover, or brown. One morning, it was still dark when I awakened. The pre-dawn singing of the birds had faded away. The voices of the insects had died, 
and the air had assumed the crispness of fall. The crunch of dry leaves could be heard underfoot. It was somehow as if it had never happened before. The crows were flying in noisy flocks again. The brilliant blue petals of the gentians had dried up and fallen away, leaving behind only the bright flowers of an aster here or there. The first light the frost had sky come, is the, plain the and belligerent sister winds of had the started. Skies. The sad sack one, the ash sky, all gray and featureless, pale in the morning, pale at noon, pale at night. The winter sunrises are late and boringly pastel, and the sunsets are equally and boringly pastel. The earth in winter stares blankly back at the cold and featureless sky, does nothing to enhance or mimic it. Even the stars in winter do not seem to sparkle as they do at other times of the year. The landscape was black and barren. But where the grasses still stood, the landscape was covered with a soft, loose, black gate of snow. It was one of the services that the dense sod performed for all the plants on the prairie to catch and save the precious snow to feed the burst of new growth in the spring. No bird sang. The grasses did not rustle. There was no buzzing of insects and no croaking of frogs at the stockyards. Even the farm implements were silent. Perhaps I was experiencing a magnification rather than a distillation. The sensations that came into my ears and eyes began to break apart like the grains of color in a photographic negative magnified too many times. A cattail reed 20 yards away slapped in a sudden gust of wind, and I was startled by the gigantic sound of it. I felt myself slipping away to a blueness of my own. My sense of my size in relation to the landscape diminished. The hills beyond the lake seemed to recede. Its opposite shore seemed to pull away. It got harder and harder to make out the waving line of the fragmites on the fen that rose between the lake and the hills. But it seemed a unity of land and sky and water now began to disintegrate. The landscape seemed increasingly to be a succession of lines. The line of hills, the line of trees, the line of reeds, the line of cattails, the line of water. And less and less did there seem to be any communication among them. I increasingly made my own distinct and desperate mark on the landscape. A prairie never rests for long, nor does it permit anything else to rest. It has barriers to neither men nor wind and encourages them to run together, which may be why grasslands men are notorious travelers and hard goers by wind, gross and running fierce and frozen. As I looked about me, I felt that the grass was the country, as the water is the sea. The red of the grass made all the great prairie the color of wine stains, or of certain seaweeds when they are first washed up. And there was so much motion in it whole country seemed, somehow, to be running. The once great prairies, with their fruits and wildlife, nourished our nation yes. through its weak infancy. That's they nourished it again through its reckless and wasteful adolescence. Honey. The nation has now reached a maturity, that which would make it capable of recognizing that the prairie can the no prairie. longer give because it is a part of our past, and that as man destroys it, nature in our daily lives may well be an inherent biological necessity, not a luxury. Millions of years of inheritance and culture have programmed us to a natural habitat of fresh air and a very wild landscape unspoiled by the disturbance of civilization. Not only is the physical impact the of the prairie may be gone, important, but, it is not but man's possible. psychological well-being is, may well rest the on recapturing the, the essence of the prairie. Somehow, in some way, return to those days of yesteryear and grasp what 
least for a moment. And stay some of the wonder and magic of our day. Inside me is a western prairie, a mystical buffalo, big sky above, waiting for settlers to civilize me proper. Bring your plows, bring logs to build homes, make your children, dig your wells and graves, pray to your tenuous God, keep your Bible close, let your Winchester closer for those heathens hell-bent on keeping us off their sacred ground. Manifest destiny destroys us all eventually. There are only a few tall prairies left today, but they are worth seeking, worth going to and being in. They are the last lingering scraps of the old time, fragments of original wealth and beauty, cloaked with plants that you may have never seen before and may never see again. To make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee. One clover and a bee and a reverie. The reverie alone will do if bees are few.